Marriage is a mystery. And I think it's fair to say that for most of us who are married, we had no idea, you have no idea what you're getting into, you two. And I don't mean that in terms of the reality checks that come in a marriage, which I'm sure we can all relate to, the romance fading, that it isn't Disney and Hollywood all the time, the definition of love changing and morphing into deeper and what you didn't think was a part of love kind of things, your partner never really changing like you hoped they would and expanding, and the busyness of life sapping your relational energies and you really just don't have it, any gas in the tank to love them. Your kids coming along, if God's given you kids, Lord knows that changes the romance in marriage. An accident happens. One of you in, takes on a chronic illness and it changes everything. Or, God help us, an affair happens. Something like that happens in your marriage. I'm not talking about the mystery of all of those things. I'm talking about an even greater mystery than those mysteries. One that most of us who are married have no idea we've gotten into. When the Apostle Paul talks about marriage, he uses the word mystery for a much bigger reason. He talks about a greater mystery that marriage embodies. To Paul, a marriage is emblematic of God through Christ's relationship to the church, to you. So that relationship between the maker of all things and you is mysteriously connected to your relationship with another person in marriage and really your relationship with any other human being. This is how Paul writes about it to the church warning on some of the language in this, because I know it'll tick half of you off just to hear how it starts, but this was Paul's day and age, and listen to the whole thing. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, he writes. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now before you blow a fuse on that submit word, <laughs> listen, and it, you know, sometimes in churches that's the only part they quote, and women get subjugated in very unchristlike and unhealthy and unbiblical ways because people take that first bit and they run with it as though that's God's model for marriage. There, the, the passage goes on to say... Listen to how the husband is called to submit. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The submission that a husband is called to is death for the sake of his wife, giving up everything for her. So this passage is about mutual submission with the bigger onus, if any, on the husband than the wife. All right, enough preaching. Just read the thing, John. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Because when you love the person you're with, and if the person you're with, you're together as one, then you're kind of loving yourself. Husbands loving their wives, or wives loving their husbands. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated his own, their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are all, for we are members of his body. For this reason, and now we're getting to the mystery part. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Marriage is a mystery 
a relational mystery that points to an even greater relational, the greatest relational mystery imaginable. God's relationship to us through Christ. The union that I share with my spouse is emblematic of, a foretaste of, a pointer to the ultimate union that all human beings in the Christian story are made for and called to. The love we live as a couple can be iconic if we let it be, something that you look through in order to see a deeper truth, in this case, the presence of God. And for all we know, your love as a couple may be even more than that. You can actually see, perhaps, the love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit when marriage, marital love, is done right. The Father loving the Son wholeheartedly and doing anything for His Son. The Son honoring His Father and laying down His life and obeying to the point of death for His Father's sake. The Spirit, this beautiful love of God moving between them and ever submissive, ever mutually dependent, ever mutually submitting ways. Marriage could point to the very center of the nature of God. So, marriage is no small thing. It's a mystery with the potential to point to something that big. Which makes me wonder if if I'd have had that in mind more in my 30 years of marriage so far, God willing, thank you, could it have been more? Or can it be going forward more? Or can it be entering into it more knowing that your relationship points to that? I mean, if you think about it, that could change everything. Every expression of love between you could be a moment that could point to an expression of love from God to you or you to God or within the Godhead. And what is love? You've heard it at a hundred weddings, maybe. Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And Paul was single, the writer of those words, so you got to think he got that definition from his relationship with God. This is the love of God that he describes in those words. So, your wife shows you patience yet again for that thing you've done that you always do or that thing that you've left undone that you always leave undone. And she has held her tongue again and cut you some slack and she's extended you the grace of a little bit more time so that you can see it for yourself. That thing that could have drove her nuts and maybe inside does and cause her to speak out or lash out, she chooses to let go of because her love for you in the greater scope of things is greater than that one troublesome, oh, so troublesome thing. So this happens occasionally with me and my wife. And I know it happens when after I do it again, and I even know it as I'm doing it, or shortly thereafter, and there's always a pause, and then this is what happens. Fran then looks at me with that look that says she knows, and I then now know, and she looks at me and she says, I love you, John. And she does. She chooses to be patient and instead replaces what could be an angry response with what she is going to choose to believe about me and toward me 
I love you, John. Now, for too many years, I've seen her heart in between those moments and transactions in our relationship. But not all that often have I considered the heart of God just in behind her as she does it, considered God's patient love. I mean, I test God's heart in this relationship all the time. I ignore God, I doubt his presence, his love, I don't trust him, I behave in ways that are not good, and yet I am still here and I have not been smitten, no lightning bolts yet, thank you. In fact, I don't feel condemned or judged by God at all, not the God that I've come to know through our Christian faith, the God of grace. In fact, I know he loves me in spite of all that. And through Christ in me, looks at me differently and sees me as his. I know that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So God is always patient with me. And every time Fran is, I can remember that. A just-in-time experience, a one-day fully foretaste of a love of God patiently expressed through her can, in a way, mysteriously reveal his face. When someone is patient, they image the God who is patient. When Fran is patient with me, she gives evidence to the fact that she knows God and is made by God. And for all I know in that moment, God is enabling her and giving her the God-given, heaven-on-earth strength to be patient with me. And when she extends that to me in that moment, miraculously, I become more patient. I receive that. How could anybody not become a better human being had they experienced the patient love of God? And if you understood that to be happening, every time somebody who loved you showed patience. Now imagine that kind of math playing out in all kinds of relational categories. Every time you experience kindness or humility, every time you experience humility, you engage the humility of God through Christ. Every time you feel trusted, you realize a God's presence who trusts you with your life, gives you will and free will. Selflessness, forgiveness, honor, hope, perseverance, all those words Paul used. If every time you lived them, God was there. I mean, pretty soon the mystery of you two being one would get blurred with you two being one in him, and you wouldn't know if the love was his or yours or hers or his, and it would be this beautiful co mingling, co-inhering union that would result where it wouldn't matter because it would just be beautiful and glorify God. Imagine how empowering that could be relationally. I think that's the way marriage is meant to work. I mean, there are some Christian traditions, the Catholic tradition in particular, that call marriage a sacrament, a means of grace within which we can experience, through which we can experience God. And given the sad state of marriage in our culture, we should all go with the doctrine of the sacrament of marriage and invest in it. It might change everything. Imagine how it would change if every moment was an opportunity a good relational moment to experience the present love of God. So, that's your homework this week if you're married or if you're in a relationship or you love somebody, your daughter. Every moment where it happens, do the math. Think about a God who's given you that moment, who's authored that moment, who thought about that moment before the creation of the universe and is there present to that moment where you even think that he could be. And then receive the gift of that moment as a gift from that person, but also a gift from God. Or as you're giving it, as a gift you're giving, but also something God is doing through you. 
And in the giving and receiving, thank God for the moment. Because there's something about gratitude that increases recognition, that opens your eyes to the giftedness of life. And in that moment of gratitude, know in a mystical, magical, beautiful way the presence of God who made you. And then feel the union grow between you and them and you and him and him and them and all us together. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everyone becoming more fully mature in Christ, as Paul writes, with all the energy of Christ so powerfully working in you, in us. We won't know where the love is coming from, but we won't care because it'll all be for him. And then we'll be closer to, we won't be there yet, but we'll be closer to what we're meant to be. You will be more fully Christine. And you'll be more fully Martin. And together you'll be more fully one. And somehow when people look at it, they'll see the love of God. And you'll experience there, it there. And you'll be you. Life begins, proceeds, and ends in Christ, said one theologian. The writer of the book of Acts, Luke says, For in him we live and move and have our being. We are his offspring. God made you for that kind of relational intimacy and wholeness. And he gives you, if you're in a marriage or a friendship or even a parental relationship, he gives you these things to point to the, the fact that you belong to him as a means through which a sacrament to enter into his beautiful love so that we can die with him, so that we can be raised with him and have a real life right now. I think that's what your life, I think that's what my life, I think that's what our lives, I think it's what Jocelyn and AJ's life as they formally get married, I think that's what it's meant to be. Like, don't aim too low. God has given you her, him. Let's pray. The words holy matrimony come to mind. Just feeling and hearing all of that, God. We sometimes treat marriage as throwaway or as this way of, of uh, completing ourselves or in, in ways that are sometimes selfish and self-full. Uh, we lose and have lost sight of humility and honor and respect for others and submission in a mutual way and, and things are busted and broken and so many of us here have experienced that bustedness and brokenness. Uh, we could use a little more holy in our matrimony. A lot more of your presence in the brokenness. More of your light to shine through the cracks that are now present between us and our loved one. A light that can show a new way or bring a new patience or a new kind of love. Uh, a light that says I'm making all things new and that heals and forgives and restores. A light that comes to us and walks with us and knows what destroyed relationship is like and has felt the pain of that and has the, has the solution for that. That light, Lord, your light, you are the light we all need. So be a light for every person here, uh, all relationships here. Heal, restore, make new, draw us to you and to one another, we pray. So that you would be honored so that we would be ourselves, so that we would be able to see you, love you, 
we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.